Hello folks, welcome to the next episode of Electromagnetism. Today we're going to start with a lecture on electric potential. So let's begin. Let's say you have a positive charge. What are the electric field lines for a positive charge? Well, they are radially outwards. Let's say you have a negative charge. What are the electric field lines for negative charge? Same idea, but now the electric field lines are radially inwards. Now, if you look at both of these, you might see something curious. The electric field lines are all straight, right? No one in Regents Physics dares to ask, well, why don't you have electric field lines that go like this or like that or like this for a positive charge? Although it is the case that when you bring two positive and negative charges close to each other, you have curvy field lines like this. We'll get to those complicated situations later. But just looking at the positive and negative charges in this case, you see that the field lines don't seem to bend. They don't seem to curve. And in fact, that tells us that the electric field is a very special kind of vector field. In fact, it's a vector field that has the following property. A vector field whose curl is zero. And for such vector fields, they admit a scalar potential function. Because of this, we can say that there exists, there exists a scalar potential function V such that the gradient of V times a minus sign, which is just convention, is equal to the electric field. And that's all that the electric potential is. The electric potential is just a scalar potential function. So this right here is the electric potential. All right. With that being said, let's go ahead and go into some of the more nuances of the electric potential. So let me go ahead and raise this. And let's take a look at two of the big defining ideas for electric potential. So first of all, you've seen the definition of the electric potential. You've seen it defined right now as the gradient of the electric potential is equal to the electric field. But let's say you want to know the potential from the electric field. Well, that's quite straightforward. The potential function, the electric potential, is simply minus the integral of the electric field dot dl, where dl is some kind of path that you're going. Okay, well, let's say that you have a situation like this, a spherical shell with some charge, surface charge density outside, and let's say that this is some radius r, capital R, and let's say you want to find the potential somewhere inside this spherical shell. Let's say at some radius small r. How would you do so? Well, here's how you could do it. You could use Gauss's law to determine the electric field outside the spherical shell, E r greater than capital R. You could use Gauss's law to find the electric field within the spherical shell, E r less than capital R. Spoiler alert, the electric field within a spherical shell is zero. And spoiler alert, this will just be kq over r squared. But nevertheless, you can use Gauss's law to find the electric fields both inside and outside the spherical shell and then what you can do is you can simply integrate those multiply it by a negative sign to get the electric potential but be careful just because the electric field is zero inside the spherical shell does not mean that the electric potential is zero the electric potential depends on where you define your ground just like when you deal with gravitational potential energy a ball over here has a height of mg has a GPE of MGH, but H depends on where you define your ground to be. For example, if you're throwing a ball off the top of a cliff, if the ground is, well, quite literally the Earth's ground, then H is the height of the cliff. But if the ground is the, the cliff itself, well, then the, the ball initially has no potential energy since, well, it's starting from the ground. So, in a very similar way, electric potential depends wholly on where you define your ground to be. Often you will see that the ground is defined to be at spatial infinity. Okay, so if you see this, then you will know that the electric potential at a spatial infinity is defined to be zero, and now you can figure out the electric potential here, and then um, pierce inward 
and then find the electric potential inside. So for example, let's say you find the electric potential outside, Vr greater than capital R. Well, the electric potential inside then, inside this vertical shell, will actually be equal to the electric field outside this vertical shell set to the radius of the spherical shell plus the integral, right, of the electric field outside, inside the spherical shell, dot DL, as follows. Okay, so this is the big defining idea for electric potential. Okay, so now let's go ahead, take a look at an example problem and get started. Here is another view of problem one. All right, folks, so let's take a look at the problem. Find the electrostatic potential V of zero comma zero comma Z, which means find the electric potential only along the Z axis right here, along the axis of a circular loop of charge lambda per unit length and radius A. So here is the charge density lambda and the linear charge density lambda and the radius A of the loop. B, show that the potential V electric potential V reduces to the expected value far from the loop. And C, use the potential from A to find the electric field around the z-axis. Let's start with part A, find the electrostatic potential. The electrostatic potential looks like this. Remember that the electrostatic potential is defined as minus the integral of the electric field along some path. As you can see, this is a dot product. So taking the integral of two vector functions that, are, that have the dot product of them gives us a scalar function. Now, remember that the electric field itself is k, 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught q over r squared. So if we take that integral of that and put a minus sign, then we can get the electric potential, which is simply kq over r. Now, you might be wondering, wait a minute, what happened to the minus sign? Well, when we do the integration, look what happens. 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught q over r squared. Let's say we're headed in the radial direction so that the r hat and the r hats, their dot product produce 1. And so we're going to simply have the electric potential is equal to, pull out the constants, minus 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught. Hopefully you can still see up to here q and then we integrate r to the minus 2 dr well from infinity to some point to s infinity is our reference point our ground point let's say so this is going to give us um, when you integrate r prime to the negative 2 that becomes negative r prime to the negative 1 hence that negative and this negative cancel each other out to give you 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught q over r prime as r prime starts from your reference point of infinity to whatever point you want to stop at. And so this ultimately gives you the electric potential which we wrote down here. Okay, 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught q over r. So we're going to use this to solve the first part. So let me get my eraser and erase everything here. So we need to find the electrostatic potential V along the axis of the circular loop of charge. So along the z-axis. So at a certain point, for example, P over here. So that's where we need to find our electrostatic potential at a point like this, P. And we know, we've just found out that the electrostatic potential is simply K, 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught Q over R. Well, we know what Q is. In our case, Q is simply going to be lambda, the linear charge density, times, well, how long you have to go around this loop. And that's simply the circumference of the loop. So this is going to be 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught times lambda times 2 pi A. That's going to give you all of your charge divided by the radius, right? What's the radius? Well, the radius is the distance from where do you want to find the electric potential to where the source charge is. And so what this radius is is simply, let's call this distance over here z. So this distance is simply going to be 
the square root of z squared plus a squared. Okay, so that's your electric potential. Part B says, show that the electric potential reduces to the expected value far from the loop. Far from the loop means that z is significantly greater than a. In which case, you can simply forget about this factor of a squared, right? So you'll be left with 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught, lambda 2 pi a, lambda times 2 pi a over z. But hey, what is that? That looks a lot like this, right? In which case, this is our q. So far away from this circular loop of charge, the electric potential looks just like the electric potential for a single charge with this much of a magnitude. And finally, part C says use the potential from part A to find the electric fields around the Z, along the z-axis. So all we have to do, remember, let me use a different color now. The electric field is defined as the minus the gradient of the electric potential. So let me erase this, write it again. So let's take the negative of the gradient of the electric potential. We have the electric potential right here. All we have to do is take its gradient. So let's see how far down I can go. Okay, so minus, now where am I headed? What's my, what's my direction for gradient? Well, in this case, I'm interested in the z direction, right? So I'm going to do partial, partial z, right? Because that's what the gradient is all about, going in the direction of interest. In this case, my direction of interest is the z-axis. Minus partial, partial z of this stuff. So let's bring out the one over four, let's bring out all of the constants and just leave the hard stuff, the z involved stuff inside. So one over four pi epsilon naught, that's my constant factor, two pi a lambda over, okay, so that's what we have to take the gradient of. So partial, partial z of z squared plus a squared to the negative half. Well, taking the derivative of this is quite standard stuff, right? That negative half is gonna come outside, followed by the inside to the negative three halves. And of course, I'm going to multiply this by two a because of, sorry, two z because of the chain rule. Take the derivative of the inside. And so that two and the half are gonna cancel each other out. And so this is what we're left with, right? So the electric field we are left to conclude, where can I write it? Let's write it right here. The electric field for this charge distribution is going to be uh, minus one over four pi epsilon naught, but this minus and this minus produce a positive sign. So one over four pi epsilon naught, two pi a lambda, two pi a lambda over, oh, and times z, e, over z squared plus a squared to the 3 halves power. And what direction is the electric field in? The k hat direction, which makes sense, right? Because the electric field vectors will cancel out so that they only had all of their x, y plane axis vectors would cancel out. So it only heads in the positive k hat direction or the z hat direction. So folks, this is how you solve this entire problem. Hopefully you learned something and we'll see you in the next lecture.